So this is going to be a series of Solomon Kane and Robert R. Howard's stories that the the the, uh, the, the stories, the acts uh, that come with the game are based on. Um, I'm going to be narrating each of those stories uh, in as part of the series, and I'm going to be showing uh, the miniatures as I go through that to try and tie in things, and then I'll be a little bit of a discussion afterwards as well about how I think possibly the uh, the games might might work you linking to the story now obviously uh this will come with some spoilers so if you actually want to know don't want to know any of the stories at all and the plots and what kind of happens uh then you don't have to listen to this uh, but just be aware that mythic games have already said that you know you can change the path that solomon kane goes on compared to the books and that can change in in the stories and in the campaigns that you follow in the game so Without further ado, let's start with Skulls in the Stars. Skulls in the Stars. He told how murders walk the earth. Act 1. There are two roads to Tokatown. One, the shorter and more direct route, leads across a barren upland moor. And the other, which is more longer, winds its torturous way in and out among the hummocks and quagmires of the swamps, skirting the low hills to the east. It was a dangerous and tedious trail, so Solomon Kane halted in amazement when a breathless youth from the village he had just left overtook him and implored him, for God's sake, to take the swamp road. The swamp road? Kane stared at the boy. He was a tall, gaunt man, was Solomon Kane. His darkly pallid face and deep, brooding eyes made more sombre by the drab, puritanical garb he affected. Uh, yes, sir, tis far safer, the youngster answered to his surprised exclamation. Then the moor road must be haunted by Satan himself, for your townsmen warn me against traversing the other. Because of the quagmire, sir, that you might not see in the dark, you had better return to the village and continue your journey in the morning, sir. Taking the swamp road? Yes, sir. Cain shrugged his shoulders and shook his head. The moon rises almost as soon as twilight dies. By its light I can reach Talker Town in a few hours across the moor. Sir, you had better not. No one ever goes that way. There are no houses at all upon the moor, while in the swamp there is the house of old Ezra who lives there all alone since his maniac cousin Gideon wandered off and died in the swamp and was never found. And old Ezra, though a miser, would not refuse you lodging should you decide to stop until morning. Since you must go, you'd better go to the swamp road. Kane eyed the boy piercingly. The lad squirmed and shuffled his feet. Since this moor road is so dour to wayfarers, said the Puritan, why did not the villagers tell me the whole tale instead of vague mouthings? Men like that not to talk of it, sir. We hoped that you would take the swamp road after the men advised you to, but when we watched and saw you had turned not at the forks, they sent me to run after you and beg you to reconsider. Name of the devil, exclaimed Sharp sharply, Cain sharply, the unaccustomed oath showing his irritation. The swamp road and the moor road. What is it that threatens me, and why should I go miles out of my way to risk the bogs and mires? Sir, said the boy, dropping his voice and drawing closer, we be simple villagers who like not to talk of such things, lest foul fortune befall us. But the moor road is a way accursed and hath not been traversed by any of the countryside for a year or more. It is deaf to walk amongst those moors at night, as hath been found by some score of unfortunates. Some foul horror haunts the way and claims men for his victims. So, and what of this like thing? No man knows. None has ever seen or lived. But flate farmers have heard terrible laughter far out of the fen, and men have heard the horrid shrieks of its victims. Sir, in God's name, return to the village. There pass the night, and tomorrow take the swamp trail to Tocca Town. Far back in Cain's gloomy eyes, a scintillant light had begun to glimmer, like a witch's torch glinting under fathoms of cold grey eyes. His blood quickened. Adventure, the lure of life, risk and drama, 
Not that Cain recognised his sensations as such. He sincerely considered that he voiced his real feelings when he said, These things be deeds of some power of evil. The lords of darkness have laid a curse upon the country. A strong man is needed to combat, combat Satan and his might. Therefore I will go, who have defied him many a time. Sir, the boy began, then closed his mouth as he saw the futility of argument. He only added, The corpses of the victims are bruised and torn, sir. He stood there at the crossroads, sighing regretfully as he watched the tall, rangy figure swinging up the road that led towards the moors. The sun was setting as Cain came over the brow of the low hill which debouched into an upland flen. Huge and blood-red it sank down ben behind the sullen horizon of the moors, seeming to touch the rank grass with fire. So for a moment the watcher seemed to be gazing out across a sea of blood. Then the dark shadows came gliding from the east, the western blaze faded, and Solomon Cain struck out boldly in the gathering darkness. The road was dim from disuse, but was clearly defined. Cain went swiftly but warily, sword and pistols at hand. Stars blinked out of the night, and night winds whispered among the grass-like weeping spectres. The moon began to rise, lean and haggard, like a skull among the stars. Then suddenly Cain stopped short. From somewhere in front of him sounded a strange and eerie echo, or something like an echo. Again this time louder, Cain started forward again. Were his senses deceiving him? No. Far out, there pealed the whisper of frightful slaughter. And again, closer this time, no human being ever laughed like that. There was no mirth in it, only hatred and horror and soul-destroying terror. Cain halted. He was not afraid, but for the second he was almost unearthed. Then, stabbing through that awesome laughter, came the sound of a scream that was undoubtedly human. Cain started forward, increasing his gait. He cursed the elusive lights and flickering shadows which failed the more in rising moon and made accurate sight impossible. The laughter continued, growing louder, as did the screams, then sounded faintly the drum of frantic human feet. Cain broke into a run. Some human was being hunted to death out there on the fen, and by what manner of horror God only knew. The sound of the flying feet halted abruptly, and the screaming rose unbearably, mingled with other sounds unnameably and hideous. Evidently the man had been overtaken, and Cain, his flesh crawling, visualised some ghastly fiend of the darkness, crouching on the back of its victim, crouching and tearing. Then the noise of a terrible and short struggle came clearly through the abysmal silence of the night, and the foothills began again, but stumbling and uneven. The screaming continued, but with a gasping gurgle, the sweat stood cold on Cain's forehead and body. This was heaping horror and horror in an intolerable manner, God for a moment's clear light. The frightful drama was being enacted within a very short distance of him, to judge by the ease of which the sounds reached him. But this hellish half-life failed all in shifting shadows, so that the moors appeared a haze of blurred illusions and stunted trees, and bushes seemed like giants. Cain shouted, striving to increase the speed of his advance. The shrieks of the unknown broke into a hideous shrill, squealing, Again there was the sound of a struggle, and then from the shadows of the tall grass a thing came reeling. A thing that had once been a man. A gore-covered, frightful thing that fell at Cain's feet and writhed and grovelled and raised its terrible face to the rising moon, and gibbered and yammered and fell down again and died in its own blood. The moon was up now, and the light was better. Cain bent above the body, which lay stark in its unnameable mutilation, and he shuddered at rare thing for him, who had seen the deeds of the Spanish Inquisition and the witch-finders. Some wayfarer, he supposed. Then, like a hand of ice on his spine, he was aware that he was not alone. He looked up, his cold eyes piercing the shadows whence the dead man had staggered. He saw nothing, but he knew he felt. The other eyes gave back his stare. Terrible eyes not of this earth. He straightened and drew a pistol, waiting. The moonlight spread like a lake of pale blood over the moor, and trees and grasses took on their proper sizes. The shadows melted and Cain saw. At first, he thought it only a shadow of mist, a whisper of moor, fog that swayed in the tall grass before him. He gazed, 
More illusion, he thought. Then the thing began to take on shape, vague and indistinct. Two hideous eyes flamed at him, eyes which held all the stark horror which had been the heritage of a man since the fearful dawn ages. Eyes frightful and insane, with an insanity transcending earthly insanity. The form of the thing was misty and vague, a brain-shattering travesty of a human form, like, yet horribly unlike. The grass and bushes beyond showed clearly through it. Cain felt the blood pound in his temples, yet it was as cold as ice. How such an unstable being as that wavered before him could harm a man in physical way was more than he could understand. Yet the red horror at his feet gave mute testimony that the fiend could act with terrible material effect. Of one thing Cain was sure, there would be no hunting of him across this dreary moors, no screaming and fleeing to be dragged down again and again. If he must die, he would die in his tracks, his wounds in front. Now a vague and grisly mouth gaped wide and the demonic laughter again shrieked out, the soul shaking in its nerve nearness. And in the midst of fe fear, threat of doom, Cain deliberately levelled his long pistol and fired. A maniacal yell of rage and mockery answered the report, and the thing came at him like a flying sheet of smoke, long shadowy arms stretched to drag him down. Cain, moving with dynamic speed of a famished wolf, fired the second pistol with as little effect, snatching his long rapier from his sheath and thrust it into the centre of the misty attacker. The blade sang as it passed clear through, encountering no solid resistance, and Cain felt icy fingers grip his limbs, bestial talons tear his garments and the skin beneath. He dropped the useless sword and sought to grapple with his foe. It was like fighting a floating mist, a flying shadow armed with dagger-like claws. His savage blows met empty air, his leanly mighty arms, in whose grasp strong men had died, swept nothingness and clutched emptiness. Naught was solid or real save the flaying ape-like fingers with their crooked talons and the crazy eyes which burned into the shuddering depths of his soul. Cain realised that he was in a desperate plight indeed. Already his garments hung in tatters and he bled from a score of deep wounds, but he never flinched. And the thought of flight never entered his mind. He had never fled from a single foe, and had the thought occurred to him when he had flourished, flushed with shame. He saw no help for it now, but that his this form should lie there beside the fragments of the other victim. But the thought held no terrors for him. His only wish was to give as good an account of himself as possible before the end came, and if he could, to inflict some damage on this unearthly foe. There above the dead man's torn body, man fought with demon under the pale light of the rising moon, with all of the advantages with the demon, save one, and that one was enough to overcome the others. For if abstract hate may bring into material substance a ghostly thing, May not courage, equally abstract, form a concrete weapon to combat that ghost? Cain fought with his arms and his feet and his hands, and he was aware at last that the ghost began to give back before him, and the fearful slaughter changed to screams of baffled fury. For man's only weapon is courage, that flinches not from the gates of hell itself, and against such not even the legions of hell can stand. Of this Cain knew nothing. He only knew that the talons which tore and rendered him seemed to grow weaker and wavering, that a wild light grew and grew in the horrible eyes, and reeling and grasping, he rushed in, grappling the thing at last and threw it. And as they tumbled about on the moor, and it writhed and lapped his limbs like a serpent of smoke, his flesh crawled and his hair stood on end, for he began to understand its gibbering. He did not hear and comprehend, as a man hears and comprehends the speech of a man, but the frightful secrets it imparted in whisperings and yammerings and screaming silences sank fingers of ice into his soul, and he knew. Act 2 The hut of old Ezra the miser stood by the road in the midst of the swamp, half screened by the sullen trees which grew about it. The wall where rotting, the roof crumbling, and great pallid and green fungus monsters clung to it and writhed about the doors and windows, as if seeking to peer within. The trees leaned above it, and their grey branches intertwined, so that it crouched in semi-darkness like a monstrous dwarf over whose shoulders ogres leer. 
The road which wound down into the swamp among rotting stumps and rank hummocks and scummy, snake-haunted pools and bogs crawled past the hut. Many people passed that way these days, but few saw old Ezra. Save a glimpse of a yellow face peering through the fungus screen windows, itself like an ugly, ugly fungus. Old Ezra the miser partook much of the quality of the swamp, for he was gnarled and bent and sullen. His fingers were like clutching parasitic plants, and his locks hung like drab moss over eyes trained to the murk of the swamplands. His eyes were like a dead man's, yet hinted of depths abysmal and loathsome as dead lakes of the swamplands. These eyes gleamed now at the man who stood in front of his hut. This man was a tall and gaunt and dark. His face was haggard and claw-marked, and he was bandaged of arm and leg. Somewhat behind this man stood a number of villagers. You are Ezra of the Swamp Road. Aye, and uh, what do you want of me? Where is your cousin Gideon, the maniac youth who abode with you? Gideon? Aye. He wandered away into the swamp and never came back. No doubt he lost his way and was set upon by wolves or died in a quagmire or was struck by an adder. How long ago? Over a year. Aye. Hark ye, Ezra the miser, soon after your cousin's disappearance, a countryman, coming home across the moors, was set upon by some unknown fiend and torn to pieces, and thereafter it became death to cross those moors. First men of the countryside, then strangers who wandered over the fen, fell to the clutches of the thing. Many men have died since the first one. Last night I crossed the moors and heard the flight and pursuing of another victim, a stranger who knew not the evil of the moors. As Rhythmizer, it was a fearful thing, for the wretch twice broke from the fiend, terribly wounded, and each time the demon caught and dragged him down again, and at last he fell dead at my very feet, done to death in a manner that would freeze the statue of a saint. The villagers moved restlessly, restlessly and murmured fearfully to each other, and old Ezra's eyes shifted furtively. Yet the sombre expression of Solomon Cain never altered, and his condor-like stare seemed to transfix the miser. Aye, aye, muttered old Ezra hurriedly. A bad thing, a bad thing. Yet why do you tell this thing to me? Aye, a sad thing. Hearken further, Ezra. The fiend came out of the shadows, and I fought with it over the body of its victim. Aye, how I overcome it. And I know not, for the battle was hard and long, but the powers of good and light were on my side, which were mightier than the powers of hell. At the last I was stronger, and it broke from me and fled, and I follow it, followed it to no avail. Yet before it fled it whispered to me a monstrous truth. Old Ezra started, stared wildly, seemed to shrink into himself. N nay, why tell me this? he muttered. I returned to the village and told my tale, said Cain, for I knew now that I had the power to rid the moors of its curse forever. Ezra, come with us. Where? gasped the miser. To the rotting oak on the moors. Ezra reeled as though struck. He screamed incoherently and turned to flee. On the instant, at Cain's sharp order, two brawny villagers sprang forward and seized the miser. They twisted the dagger from his writhered hand and pinioned his arms, shuddering as their fingers encountered his clammy flesh. Cain motioned them to follow and turning strode up the trail, followed by the villagers who found their strength taxed to the utmost in their task of bearing their prisoner along. Through the swamp they went and out, taking a little used trail which led up over the low hills and out of the moors. The sun was sliding down the horizon and old Ezra stared at it with bulging eyes, stared as if he could not gaze enough. Far out on the moors geared up the great oak tree like a gibbet, now only a decaying shell where Solomon Cain halted. Old Ezra wreathed, writhed in his captor's gasp and made inarticulate noises. Over a year ago, said Solomon Cain, you, fearing that your insane cousin Gideon would tell men of your cruelties to him, brought him away from the swamp by this very trail by which we came, and murdered him here in the night. Ezra cringed and snarled. You cannot prove this lie! Cain spoke a few words to an agile villager. The youth clambered up the rotting bole of the tree, and from a crevice high up dragged something that fell with a clatter at the feet of the miser. 
Ezra went limp with a terrible shriek. The object was a man's skeleton, the skull cleft. You... How? You knew this? You are Satan, gibbered old Ezra, came folded his arms. The thing I fought last night told me this thing as we reeled in battle, and I followed it to this tree, for the fiend is Gideon's ghost. Ezra shrieked again and fought savagely. You knew, said Cain somberly. You knew what things did these deeds. You feared the ghost, the maniac, and that it would and that is why you chose to leave his body on the fen, instead of concealing it in the swamp, for you knew the ghost would haunt the place of his death. He was insane in life, and in death he did not know where to find his slayer. Else he had come to you in your hut. He hates man but you, but his mazed spirit can not tell one man from the other, and he slays all, lest he let his killer escape. Yet he will not know you and rest in peace. Forever after. Hate hath made of this ghost. Solid thing that can rend and slay. And though he feared you terribly in life. In death he fears you not at all. Cain halted. He glanced at the sun. All this I had from Gideon's ghost. In his yammerings and his whisperings and his shrieking silences. Naught but your death will lay that ghost. Ezra listened in breathless silence, and Cain pronounced the words of his doom. A hard thing it is, said Cain somberly, to sentence a man to death in cold blood, and in such a manner as I have in mind. But you must die, that others may live, and God knoweth you deserve death. You shall not die by noose, bullet, or sword, but by the talons of him you slew, for naught else will satate him. At these words, Ezra's brain shattered, his knees gave way and he fell groveling and screaming for death, begging them to burn him at the stake, to flay him alive. Cain's face was set like death, and the villagers, the fear rousing their cruelty, bound the screeching wretch to the oak tree, and one of them bade him make his peace with God. But Ezra made no answer, shrieking in a high, shrill voice with unbearably monotony. Then the villager would have struck the miser across the face, but Cain stayed him. Let him make his peace with Satan, whom he is more like to meet, said the Puritan grimly. The sun is about to set. Loose his cords so that he may look wo loose, uh, so he may work loose by dark, since it is better to meet death free and unshackled than bound like a sacrifice. As they turned to leave him, old Ezra yammered and gibbered unhuman sounds and then fell silent, staring at the sun with terrible intensity. They walked across the fen and Cain flung a last look at the grotesque form bound to the tree seeming in the uncertain light like a great fungus growing to the bowl and suddenly the miser screamed hideously death death there are skulls in the stars life was good to him though he was gnarled and churlish and evil Cain sighed mayhap God have a place for such a soul where fire and sacrifice may cleanse them of their dross as fire cleans cleans the forest of fungus things yet my heart is heavy within me nay sir nay sir one of the villagers spoke you have done but the will of god and good alone shall come of this night deed nay answered cain heavily i know not i know not the sun had gone down and night spread with amazing swiftness as if great shadows came rushing down from unknown voids to cloak the world with hurrying darkness. Through the thick night came a weird echo, and the men halted and looked back the way they had come. Nothing could be seen. The moor was an ocean of shadows, and the tall grass about them bent in long ways before the faint wind, breaking the deathly stillness with breathless murmurings. Then far away, the red disk of the moon rose above the fen, and for an instant a grim silhouette was etched blackly against it. A shape came flying across the face of the moon, a bent, grotesque thing whose feet seemed scarcely to touch the earth, and close behind came a thing like a flying shadow, a nameless, shapeless horror. A moment the racing twain stood out boldly against the moon, then they merged into an 
one unnameable, formless mass and vanished in the shadows. Far across the fen sounded a single shriek of terrible laughter. Okay, so that was um, Skulls and the Stars. And it, it <laughs> what a great story, <laughs> first of all. Um, I believe it's set in Scotland, in the moors of Scotland. And uh, it follows the tale of Solomon Cain travelling um, to the town, which I presume he's been summoned to, uh, Tocker Town. And he's just left the village, uh, meeting the child. So this is the child. Uh, so obviously this is Solomon Cain's uh, figure you can see on the screen. And then uh, we've got the miniature of the child, um, which trying to plead with Solomon Cain to follow the swamp path, of course. Uh, but Solomon Cain, being the Puritan, um, notices that this this means that there is a true evil uh, in the moor route, going across the moor um, from the tales and the stories that people have said from the village. So he sets off to the moors. Um, bettering the judgment of the child and the villagers that he came from and uh he hears the screams and the torturous screams of of a victim uh who will be the traveler i I'm, well it's pretty clear it's the traveler um from the miniature um now i think whereas in the story of course uh the traveler literally comes out of the mist of the moor uh, and just dies at the feet of solomon cain um i think there's going to be a bit more of a i mean obviously there's the whole point of the game is to expand this story and to maybe change a few things. So might you be able to, to rescue the traveller? So rather than the, the three attacks that the story um, describes, perhaps you can um, you can confront the ghost, Gideon's ghost, before uh, the traveller has come to his wounds. Uh, which brings me to Gideon's ghost, of course. Uh, so you don't know it's Gideon's ghost until, um, of course, um, uh, they tussle at the end of the encounter um but you know uh, the description is quite clearly a ghost um and then uh, solomon kane's uh, earthly weapons do nothing and this is this is the great thing about this game uh, i love what mythic games have done and um especially jake in in, in writing this, uh, this 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 rule set and designing the game is the fact that um you, you you're you're playing as virtues in the game you're not playing as solomon kane you're you're leading solomon kane you're, you're kind of like um taking him down certain paths and this is a prime example uh, th this encounter would be amazing um and uh all of his physical weapons don't do a thing so he's got to call upon his courage and it, it, it you know it, it really does describe it in the in the story that he calls upon courage as a virtue to defeat the ghost and to weaken the ghost anyway and that's what happens so perhaps in the game um, if you're playing Star Skulls in the Stars, perhaps a tactic, and I could be completely wrong here, will be to make sure that courage goes out onto the board. Because your virtues, when you play the game, you can actually get them out onto the board. You have to spend resources, of course, um, but it is a possibility. Uh, so that's probably going to be the number one thing to try and do against Gideon's Ghost. But that's what happens in the story, and then he finds out the truth. The truth that, um, affected by following the ghost, uh, finding out where Gideon was uh, murdered um, by his cousin, and then he finds the truth which brings us to act two where solomon kane with the villagers um i think from it, it's not clear but uh, this is either from the village or from tocker town i'm not really sure i think it's from the village to be honest where the boy was uh they they go to confront ezra um and then he kind of baits him into uh trying to confess uh, which is kind of it's kind of down the puritan route i guess um but ezra obviously doesn't confess uh, until um solomon kane effectively tells him the story of what what he saw when he uh, had the uh, encounter with Gideon's ghost and then they take him to uh, the site at which Ezra murdered Gideon um, um, with the villagers and tied him to the tree and then to, to basically to dispel Gideon's ghost to, to finally make him at rest um, Gideon will have to take revenge upon Ezra so uh, Solomon Cain is doing this, but he he holds a heavy heart to do this. The villagers are definitely thinking this is this is a a holy thing, a good thing, a pure thing. Uh, it's going to save all the travellers and all the the uh, the villagers that uh, they'll be able to cross the moor now and and not be in fear of this of Gideon's ghost. And it, it will lay to rest, but at the uh, the hest of um, Ezra, of course. Um, but Solomon Cain knows that Ezra has got a lot of evil in him 
but he hopes that there is a part that will um that will uh give him entrance to the godly fields and, and a bit of mercy from him so yeah it, it just ties in so well um to the uh, story and you know you can you can pick these stories up for next to nothing i think this one was on a uh, amazon at about 50p or something um uh, and you get a, a number of these stories uh, and it just gives you a bit of context before you play the game now as i said when you actually play the game the route at which uh, solomon kane takes and his story can be different and they've already stressed that which i think is is fantastic it means that you can you know you might know the story sort of skull skulls in the stars when you just listen to it you might know it really well but what if it changes what if things change slight difference it's still going to be the same core story the idea of gideon's ghost and ezra and all the rest of it but will it change slightly and and can you play it out just as the story intended very interesting okay so that was the first episode of solomon kane stories which was skulls in the stars and just to get a little bit of background information a little bit about the context of what these stories are talking about um we'll move on to episode two next time but i hope you enjoyed